Let me just say the following things. There is no systematic quantitative evidence looking at national performance and national budgets for science or R&D that the government funding of R&D does anything other than displace the private funding of R&D. There is no evidence that the public funding of R&D stimulates economic growth. There is a wealth of evidence that under the laissez-faire regime of America before 1940 or the laissez-faire regime in Britain before, 18, before 1913 when we created an entire industrial revolution without a penny of government funding that the private sector can more provide them, can do more, can provide more than it needs in terms of R&D. The idea, however, is extremely pervasive. No one believes this, though, in the case of, say, law. Everyone knows that the person who represents himself in court or herself in court has a fool for a lawyer. Everyone knows that. Only fools represent themselves in court. The law is a public good. There's nothing to stop you going to the college library here and reading the All England Law Reports. It's a public good. You can read these books and become just as good as any other lawyer. Like hell. And that's what science is like. It's an impenetrable, complex field, only open to those in very closely related fields after vast years of training. And even for them, it costs as much to make a copy as to make an innovation. Even amongst the cognoscenti, the cost of copying add up to the cost of innovation. It's just not a public good. It's not a private good, and that's the problem. It's not a private good. It is, to use the technical language, um, do people know the definition of public goods? Non, non rivalrous. You, you've heard all these stories. Technically, it is. It is not rivalrous. And uh, what's the other one? Non rivalrous and non, non excludable. It's absolutely true. My understanding of how to operate this remote control is not in any way affected if you have the same understanding and I can't stop you acquiring that understanding. So to that extent it's non-rivalrous and non-excludable. But in practice it may potentially be non-rivalrous but actually to access it costs as much as to have produced it in the first place and so it behaves as a private good in practice. And in this book, I came up with a new concept. I'm not boasting, I'm just saying how I, came, how I came around this problem. And I called it an invisible college good. By which I mean that science and practice is organized in invisible colleges. This is a term. I didn't forge that term. It's a term that's been around in the sociology of science for 50 years. But scientists form themselves in these invisible colleges because science, of course, in practice, is based on trust. Uh, science is just like the market, by the way. Um, if you want to, I mean, why do scientists publish? Why do scientists publish? I mean, if, if publishing is meant to be so bad, you know, why do you do it? Well, you publish actually because you want credibility and, and all the things that come from uh, being rewarded for what you've, you've done, including patents, by the way, have to be published. Everyone understands they have to be published. So scientists are publishing all the time, but in fact, the, peer, the, peer, the peers that review them, they have to know them personally. The reality is, you can't. You can't review a paper of someone you don't actually know if you believe what they're saying. If, if it's someone like, if, if you had a paper written by someone called Madoff, your instinct is that he's telling you an untruth and that you would, you would refuse the paper, even though it says, I have cured cancer. You think, I wonder if that's really true. But if a paper is written by someone called Albert Einstein and says, actually, space time continuum is bent in this particular way, you think, well, it's probably knows what he's talking about. And actually, that's what peer review in science is all about. It's structures based on trust by which people who know each other personally or by reputation can foster grants and publications and all the rest of it. They're called invisible colleges and they're completely separate from each other. Physicists talk to each other, biochemists talk to each other, they have nothing in common. And, and that's why I call it invisible college. And within the invisible college, science is indeed non rivalrous, non excludable. But the cost of, a, of accessing the non rivalrous and non excludable things are as high as discovering them. And by the time you have first mover advantage, either the person who makes the discovery first has a monopoly on that discovery until finally the competitors get there, um, shows that in fact the innovator has enough time to exploit his or her discovery before the competition gets there. But when the competition does get there and does copy, which they do eventually, 
It's a jolly good thing. The last thing you want is a series of monopolists. Science is almost perfect in the way it works. The inventor has a monopoly. This monopoly encourages him or her to exploit the discovery profitably. But with time, the monopoly is lost because the innately non-rivalrous and non-excludable nature of science means that eventually the competitors catch up, although it costs them a lot of money to get there, and when they do catch up, you're no longer in a monopoly, and the society therefore benefits from the non-monopolistic nature of the science. And the time scales seem to work almost perfectly. If you really wanted proof of the existence of God, it's the perfect nature by which knowledge is distributed in a free market. Because only God could have got it just so perfectly right. Thank you very much.